So today as we go to conclude our series, The Power of Grace, we're looking at Romans 15 and 16. And through the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of theology. There's a lot of very deep conversation that happens uh, through each week. And last week, one of the big things we were talking about is agape. We are talking about love and how there's multiple different words for love when we look at the Greek. And when we usually just use the word love that, like, I love my spouse, I love tacos, I love football. It's, we use the word love and it's interchangeable, but it, biblically, it uses different words. And last week was agape. Agape is the type of love that God has for us that we're supposed to have for God. But then again, when it says love your neighbor as you love yourself, it says agape your neighbor as you agape yourself. So the same love that we should have for God, we're supposed to have for our neighbor and we're also supposed to have for ourselves. And that very idea, a lot of times we struggle with because, well, how do I love God the same way I love my neighbor, the same way I love myself, that simply by looking at others and looking at ourselves the way Jesus would look at us. And that ties perfectly into our message for today because as Romans 15 and 16 hits, a lot of the theology, per se, starts to kind of go away because Paul is concluding this letter. We look at the book of Romans and we have chapters 1 through 16, but when Paul wrote this, it was one massive letter to the the Roman church. And so he starts moving into encouragement into Romans 15 and 16, and that's what we're going to look at today. The whole idea of today's message is simply how we can be encouragers to other people. How many of you enjoy when somebody encourages you? Okay. How many of you make it a regular practice to encourage other people? It's something that we need to practice. It's something that we need to make ourselves do. And so today, I want to give you six different ways. And for some of you, it'll be easy and say, well, I always do that one. That one's easy. Well, I'm going to give you other ways that you can encourage people as well with a a unique ending of our service compared to what we normally would do. But this morning, what I want to do is I want to dive right into the scripture, and then I'll get to my six points. And if I say six points, all of a sudden, I know some of you are like, oh, wow, a preacher said six points. They're quick. I promise. But we're going to look at starting at Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. We who have strong faith should help the weak with their problems. We should not please only ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors. Let us do what is good for them in order to build them up. Even Christ did not please himself. It is written, the bad things people have said about you have been aimed at me also. Everything written in the past was written to teach us. The scriptures give us strength to go on. They encourage us and give us hope. Our God is a God who strengthens and encourages you. May he give you the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had. Then you can give glory to God and with one mind and voice. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has accepted you. So accept one another in order to bring praise to God. Skipping ahead to verse 17. Because I belong to Christ Jesus, I can take pride in my work for God. I will speak about what Christ has done through me. I won't try to speak about anything else. He has been leading the Gentiles to obey God. He has been doing this by what I have said and done. He has given me power to do signs and wonders. I can do these things by the power of the Spirit of God. From Jerusalem all the way around to Alricum, I have finished preaching. In those places, I preached the good news about Christ. Now I am on my way to Jerusalem to serve the Lord's people there. The believers in Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to take an offering. It was for those who were poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were happy to do it, and of course, they owe it to them. The Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, so the Gentiles should share their earthly blessings with the Jews. I want to finish my task. I want to make sure that the poor in Jerusalem have received this offering. Then I will go to Spain. On my way, I will visit you. I know that when I come to you, I will come with the full blessing of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to join in my struggle. Join me by praying to God for me. I ask this through the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for me with the love the Holy Spirit provides. Pray that I will be kept safe from those in Judea who do not believe. I am taking the offering to Jerusalem. Pray that it will be welcomed by the Lord's people there. Then I will come to you with joy, just as God has planned. We will be renewed by being together. And then moving into chapter 16, starting in verse 3. 
This will, will be where it starts getting fun pronouncing words. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. They work together with me in serving Christ Jesus. They have put their lives in danger for me. I am thankful for them. So are all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. Greet my dear friend Epenetus. He was the first person in Asia Minor to become a believer in Christ. Greet Mary. She worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Janiah, my fellow Jews, they have been in prison with me. They are leaders among the apostles. They became believers in Christ before I did. Greet Amphilatius, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus. He works together with me in serving Christ. And greet my dear friend Stachius. Greet Apelles. He worked faithfully. To, uh, he remained faithful to Christ even when he was tested. Greet those who live in the house Arist Aristobulus. Greet Herodion, my fellow Jew. Greet the believers who live in the house of Narcius. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. Those women work hard for the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis. She is another woman who has worked very hard for the Lord. Greet Rufus. He is a chosen believer in the Lord. And greet his mother. She has been like a mother to me too. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, and Hermes. Greet Petrobas. Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister. Greet Olympus and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send their greetings. By the way, I'm not reading 16 anymore today. That's always fun going through those. How many of you are thankful that we have our names today and we don't have that many difficult names? So going through there, I intentionally wanted to read it because you can see a lot of moments where it's encourage and, and do this and do that. And what I want to do today is I want to simply break down six different ways that we can encourage other people. The first one is this, through sharing faith. Romans 15, 1 through 2 said, We who have strong faith should help the weak with their problems. We should not please only ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors. Let us do what is good for them in order to build them up. I think one of the things that can be a struggle for a lot of people in Christianity a lot of times is that we want to go to a Bible study. We want to learn more. We want to grow in our faith. And there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the problems that ends up happening is if we just keep growing and we never pour out to anyone else, what ends up happening is we grow taller and taller and taller in our faith. But then the people around us are not growing as well. Now, when we help other people when they're weak in their faith, we help them grow in their faith. How many of you are familiar with the toy Weebles? Do a, a generation check here. Weebles wobble, but they don't. All right. Those of you that don't know what a Weeble is, it's basically, it's a, it's a toy that you can push it, and it will go back and forth, but no matter what you do, it cannot fall down because it's weighted in the bottom. One of the problems I think that runs into with Christians is that we focus on, let me build myself up, let me get closer to God, let me get closer to God, and we forget about everyone around us so that when we wobble, we're going to fall down because we have nobody to catch us. If we continue to grow, all of a sudden, if we have a moment in life where we struggle with our faith and we begin to fall down and things around us are a struggle, who's going to lift us up? unless we are intentional about building up everyone who's around us. You see, we can look at someone and say, you know what, I don't think they'll ever be able to do anything in, in the faith to help me. That's not up to you to decide. Your, your role is to help build up other people. Is We're all supposed to be building disciples in the kingdom of God. That's not my job. It's all of our job. My job is to equip you to go and make disciples. As a church, if we're not all making disciples, we are completely missing the whole point of what Jesus Christ called us to do. We are supposed to be building up. My role is to equip you, to give you every tool that you need to go out and to do those things so that we are building up everyone around us so that when life throws its worst at us and I start wobbling and I start falling, I've got someone over here who can say, no, you're not going down. You shared your faith with me. Let me share my faith with you. You're in a moment of weakness. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to push you back up. That life may cause us to wobble, but we are not going to fall down. And it starts with us being intentional about encouraging other people. We have to be intentional about it. You see, 
one of the things I like doing with my girls is laying on the ground and saying, can you help me up? Because they'll come over, and especially Quinn, I love watching Quinn do it, because she'll grab onto my hand and she has the most serious look on her face. She has no fear. Like, she'll start walking. We have, have our stairs going up to our second floor, and it's got, like, the nice banister on the outside that's supposed to protect. She looks at it, of, I've got six inches of step, and let me scale the, the stairs going up. She thinks she can do a lot more than she can actually do. And so she'll grab my hand, and she puts this look on her face like she's about to, like, deadlift, like, 300 pounds. Like, if you're looking at the Olympics and the, the deadlifters as they're, they're picking up that bar, and she's... And she starts trying to pull, and so I fake like I'm being actually pulled by my two-year-old. And then all of a sudden, I'll fall back down to the ground again. And then she gets even more determined of, no, I'm going to do it this time. And eventually, I'll make her think that, yes, you helped me up. And so to me, it's a fun, cute game. But what I realize is the fact is if I'm intentional of discipling my daughter, that one day there may be a moment where I'm... I'm having a difficult moment in faith, but she can come alongside me, and who the very one who right now I'm teaching could be the one who could build me back up. We need to be intentional about encouraging each other in faith because we will have moments where we struggle. And if we're intentional about it, then we will encourage all the other people around us who will know this is what it means to be a Christian, is to encourage in faith and say, you know what, you're going through a struggle right now, but God's got this, God's got you, and be able to push you back up Life can cause us to wobble, but we will not fall down. The second idea for encouragement today is this. It's through Scripture. Romans 15.4 said, Everything written in the past was written to teach us. The Scripture gives us strength to go on. They encourage us and give us hope. How many of you, when sharing your faith with somebody, you've always kind of felt like, oh, I don't know if I have all the right words. I don't have all the right answers. What if they ask this question? I don't know the answer to that question. I might as well just not say anything because I don't want to make a fool of myself. Any, anyone ever had that thought? Like, I have moments where I still have that thought of, like, how am I going to answer every question they have? Well, John 14, 16 through 17 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Who is the spirit? Jumping ahead to verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. When we have moments of saying, you know what, I'm going to share truth. I'm going to encourage you with scripture. Look at all the times where God said he was going to do something, and then he came through and he did it. In those moments, we go to scripture. If we spend time, like we've talked about the last couple of weeks, renewing our mind in scripture, then all of a sudden when we need it, then God can bring remembrance of what it is that we need to say. It's amazing how sometimes the very answer that we need is something that God has revealed to us recently through Scripture, through something he had us read, through a time of prayer, and all of a sudden we have the right exact thought at the right exact time for somebody else that we can encourage them. But if we don't ever put it into our minds in the first place, then how can it ever come out of our mouth? You see, a lot of us have that ability of recapping things that happened. Last night, I watched a, a decent amount of the Toronto Raptors defeating the Milwaukee Bucks to go to the NBA Finals. We got, Sam is happy, Sam and Olivia. But here's the thing is, if all of a sudden I can say, well, this is, uh, this is the stat line of the game, this is how the, the, it played out, we can tell a lot of stuff and we feel confident about it. And here's the interesting thing is, no matter what it is, a, a topic, we go to Alexa and say, hey, Alexa, what's the answer for this? What's the answer for that? We don't doubt our ability in any other area of knowledge like we do the Bible. We may not have all the answers, but all of a sudden we have the Holy Spirit who is substantially more successful than Alexa is. Half the time I say something to Alexa and she doesn't even understand what I'm saying. Half the time I end up turning mute on her just because I'm tired of her. But the Holy Spirit the power that comes with the Holy Spirit if we'll just listen, what he will bring back to our memory if all we will do is renew our mind and the power of that scripture. Every moment where I've needed to be built up in my faith, 
all of a sudden, Scripture comes back into my mind. The power of Scripture to change things. It's, it's amazing to me, if you've ever had this experience as well, is when life throws its worst, and like, I don't know what I'm going to do, and then all of a sudden, a hymn, a song, a scripture, something another believer has told you, all of a sudden floods back into your memory, and it gives you peace. Those are the things that we need to do. We need to encourage others through scripture and build up their faith tank so that they know that, yeah, life is difficult right now, but God, this is what you say. This is that by your wounds we are healed, that in heaven there's going to be no more sorrow, there's going to be no more tears, there's going to be no more pain. Whatever it may be, it brings back to our memory because we have encouraged ourselves with scriptures and encouraged others with scriptures as well. The third idea this morning is this, through Christ's power. Romans 15, 17 through 18 said, because I belong to Christ Jesus, I can take pride in my work for God. I will speak about what Christ has done through me I won't try to speak about anything else. We can encourage others by sharing about the power of God through what he's done by sharing our testimony. You see, in a moment where you say, I don't know, my faith isn't where it needs to be yet, or you may be able to say, I don't have all the scriptures, I don't have all the knowledge in my head, you are an expert in one thing, for sure, yourself. Nobody knows more about you than God And so when all of a sudden you can say, yeah, you know what, I may not have that answer, I may not have this answer, but this is what God has done in my life. Nobody can challenge what God has done in your life. Nobody can challenge if God miraculously healed you where doctors said there's no way that this is going to happen, but then all of a sudden there is healing. If you looked at it and said there's no way that this relationship will ever be restored, but all of a sudden it is. Whatever it may be, you have knowledge and say, but God there is no chance of this happening. I mean, just imagine for a moment if we could bring up right now one of the Israelites who crossed the the sea when it was split and the Egyptians are behind, and they could come and stand right here at this pulpit and share their experience, how much we would be pulled into the story of that firsthand encounter. Because we can read the story in the Bible as it's recorded of what happened, but the first person This is what the emotion that we felt. This is what I remember seeing. This is what it was like to walk through that sea. It was split. That only those people could share. But what is the story that you can share that somebody desperately needs to hear that we can encourage somebody by saying, you know what, I know you're walking through this right now, but let me tell you about a God who equipped me to walk through that very same moment. It was 10 years ago and this happened. And we can encourage and empower somebody to continue moving forward, to continue to trust in God. Seek out opportunities to share your story. If you're intentional about looking for the opportunities, God is going to be intentional about giving them to you. But so often we look at what's the easiest way? What's the quickest way for me to get out of this interaction? A lot of times I have to challenge myself because I'll walk in the grocery store and my default move, I used to be a bagger, and I like my groceries bagged a certain way, and so if I've only got a few things, I'm going to go to the use scan each and every time. That way, my groceries get bagged correctly. But then there's those moments where it's get in line and actually talk to a human being instead of using the use scan. Because what if somebody needs that interaction, that conversation, that face-to-face with somebody, that I have an ability of sharing a testimony, but my desire to get out quickly, to have my groceries done a particular way, causes me to miss out on an opportunity to share a testimony. We need to always be looking for those moments. The fourth way is by meeting needs. In verses 26 and 27, it said, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to take an offering. It was for those who were poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were happy to do it, and of course, they owe it to them. The Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, so the Gentiles should share their earthly blessings with the Jews. As a church, I want us to always be known as a church that does a great job of meeting the needs of our community. It's one of the things I love about this church, the Warming Center, that be able to say for people around our county of, we know it's tough, but let us encourage you because we're going to take care of you, we're going to bring you into our building, 
that we don't care what we have to clean up afterwards or what we have to take care of. We want you to have a spot where for this week in the winter that you can sleep in a warm place, that you can have a warm, good meal, that we can meet your basic needs and take care of you. That meeting someone's needs is so easy, but so often it becomes inconvenient, so we don't want to do. That I can look at our, our food pantry that we have that people on a regular basis will call up the church and say, I'm in need, can I have assistance? And we're able to provide them food because we have a food pantry, because we have a space in our, in our church. That when people in the church are struggling, that they have issues, that we're able to identify. And because the giving to this church, we're able to look at them and say, you know what? We, we see the issue. Here's the funds we have available. Let us help you. Because that is the purpose of the church, is to take care of the basic needs so that God can slip in and take care of the spiritual needs, which are so more significant. And there's moments where these things can be a struggle because, like I said, they're not convenient to us. A week and a half ago, and I haven't even told Annie this because there wasn't, I didn't feel like a need for me to share it, but it just is what happened. Uh, We were in Grand Rapids for a graduation of one of her former students. I went to the gas station and they were selling the Aquafina water bottles uh, buy one, get one free. And so Annie had told me to buy three bottles of water. I look at him like, well, if I'm going to get three, I might as well get the free one. I go ahead and I pull out, and I'm in the, the left lane, the, the turn back to go to the hotel, and on the far right side, there's a man standing at the corner asking for help. And I didn't have any cash on me, but I'm like, I've got an extra bottle of water that I had no intention of actually needing. So I... I'm like, I could just go back to the hotel. It's, it's just a bottle of water. But I just felt that, that spirit tell me that, no, you need to go back and give him the, the extra bottle of water. And so it was inconvenient because this area was a bunch of um, the big, like, Michigan left turns, and I had to kind of work my way to get back to him. It wasn't convenient, but I worked my way back. I got into the right lane. I gave him the bottle of water, and that was it. I wish I could tell you that there was this great miraculous moment and he met Christ right there and he threw down all his, his shackles and, uh, and all his troubles just magically disappeared. No, I can't tell you any of that. But in that moment, I was able to say, I have a bottle of water for you, God bless. It was a quick moment, the light turned green, I had to go. But we never know what some of those moments compounded one after another after another could very well turn into. And ultimately, I think, if anything, it was almost more a test for me of am I willing to do what God has called me to do? Because we were on a little bit of a time crunch that we needed to get to a a dinner before we went to the graduation ceremony. But I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this because this is what I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to do right now. I'm going to meet this need. I don't know if it's uh, a need of desperation, but God, if you're telling me to do it, I'm going to do it. That's what we need to be as a church that I would love to, not based off of her personal life, but that kind of Ellen mindset of like, you get this, or Oprah, you get, you're, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. I would love to do that. Of like, hey, I'm going to give you a vacation to Cancun. Like, I can't do that. But if, think about it as a church. If we were to say, you know what, we're going to be intentional about every person that we see that's in need, that we can do something about. I may not be able to take away all your problems, but let me encourage you because I see you, God sees you, God loves you, he has not forgotten about you, he has not forsaken you, and let me pray for you. Whatever it is, give what you have to give in that moment and trust that God is working this bigger picture that we can't see. Be encouraged that you are one part of this bigger piece, but when we meet somebody else's need, we can encourage them. The fifth idea is this, is through prayer. Verses 30 through 31 said, Brothers and sisters, I ask you to join me in my struggle. Join me by praying to God for me. I ask this through the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for me with the love the Holy Spirit provides. Pray that I will be kept safe from those in Judea who do not believe. I am taking the offerings to Jerusalem. Pray that it will be welcomed by the Lord's people there. Oftentimes, just knowing that somebody is praying for us, is so powerful. It's such an encouragement that when you're going through a health struggle, knowing that you have
people in the church that are praying for you is such an encouragement. We have multiple different groups off of our, we have our Facebook page, but then we have multiple groups, and the one that by far is the most popular is our prayer group, and I see almost on a daily basis something getting posted, and then instantly, here's 20 people that are praying for that need. If you're not a part of it, I'll, I'll put up the link later today so you can join that, that group. All you have to do is simply say, yes, I attend the Shores uh, Church because I, I want it to be a community for the people of this church. But know that if you've got a prayer need, it gets prayed for. Have faith and know that God is in it and that it's something more than just saying, yeah, I'll pray for you and then forget about it. That there's people in this church who are intentional about praying and then all of a sudden they'll see you the next Sunday and say, you know what, I've been praying for you. What's the resolution? What's happened? Has, has the situation taken care of itself? Ultimately, here's the thing, and we, we had a moment of prayer during the worship time last week. I don't understand why some prayers get answered today. Some get answered four months later, and some may never get answered. But I know this is that God paid for for healing. He paid that there would be no more sickness. So I can't guarantee if it's going to happen today or if it's going to happen on the other side of eternity, but I know that God's going to bring healing. Then when we're praying, we're just asking God to speed up that timeline of saying, God, you paid for this. Can you bring it into reality right now? And then trusting and saying, if you don't, that's okay. I still love you. You're still God. You're still on the throne. You're still in control. But guess what? I'm coming back and praying about this again tomorrow because I'm not going to let it go, God, until you do something or you give me peace about it. Paul had the, 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 the thorn in his flesh, and he reached the point where he stopped praying about it because he said, God, I'm at peace at this, and I'm okay with this. But I'm going to keep praying until I reach that peace where you say it's okay or until you bring healing or until I make it to heaven and that I'm there is no more sickness, there is no more pain, there is no more sorrow, and I'm just going to trust God. It's easy for life to beat us down, but if we are consistent to pray, we encourage ourselves, and if we are consistent to pray for others, we build them up and help them realize that they are not in it alone. I know for me personally, whenever somebody says, hey, I know this is going on, I'm praying for you, it strengthens me because I realize I'm not in things alone that when I, I look at it, there's moments where when I first came here, I'm like, I'm in over my head. I was a youth pastor a month ago, and now all of a sudden I've got to take care of this issue. But I know that because of the prayers of the people of this church, that God has given me the wisdom to do everything that I need to do to help run this church the way that God wants it to be run. If I start trying to do it in my own power, we're in trouble. But if you continue to pray for me, that God would give me wisdom then I'll be able to run this church the way God intends for it to be run. I'll continue praying for you that God would equip you for every good work that he has in store for you, that he would bring healing, not so that you could just have healing, but so that you would have an enhanced testimony so that you could go and share your faith with someone else and encourage them. Because at the end of the day, it's about encouraging other people. And then the last major point that comes out in Romans 16 is this, through public statements. Paul ends this last chapter, this, this last chapter, you'll see him do this in multiple other moments. This becomes one of those chapters that if we're all going to be honest in here, if I were to say, what's your least favorite chapter in the book of Romans? Probably a decent amount of you would say, it's probably 16. I just kind of skip over it. There's all this great theology from 1 through 15, but 16, it's really just him saying thank you to a bunch of people I don't know. It's really easy to have that mentality. Same with Numbers. How many of you would say the book of Numbers is your favorite book in the Bible? I don't see any. Oh, I saw, I saw one hand. <laughs> Vicki, you got it up last time. Did, did you mean it, Vicki? Okay. Yeah, see, nobody, nobody says that Numbers is their favorite book. But if something is in the Bible, that means that it's inspired and it's holy and that God has a reason for it being in the book. And so when we look at 16, I think it's intentionally here because Paul is saying thank you to a lot of different people, but how many of you know that when somebody tells you thank you publicly, it encourages the person that's being thanked? Okay, let's be real here. How many of you like being recognized? You do a good job, somebody brings recognition to you, and then all of a sudden you feel good, and like, wow, like, I feel honored, I feel respected. And that when we are intentional to do those different things, we build people up, we encourage them. 
let's do a little bit of experiment this morning. I've got a list of people that I'm going to say thank you to right now. Nobody knows that they're on this list, but I'm going to share it anyways. Dave Sword, thank you so much for everything you've done over the course of the last two years. I know I've said it a couple times up here. You'll probably hear me say it again. And I know you'll humbly uh, say, well, it was, it was my honor to do it. But thank you. You did not know that it was going to be a two-year journey from when you accepted the role of, like, let me step in and, and help lead worship until uh, two weeks from now when the Nelsons are here and we, we have that staff member. Thank you for doing everything you have to faithfully lead this worship team in this whole two-year transition period. We could not have done it without you. I know I saw Sarah have to slip out because Gracie's going to dance in the parade. But John, this is for you and for Sarah, that thank you so much for owning the Warming Center. It was a ministry at a time that almost disappeared, but you guys stepped up and said that you would do it and that you would own it. And it's such a powerful ministry, and we would not have this ministry if it wasn't for you guys. There is countless people who have entered our church, had a warm place to stay, and food to eat, and it's because you guys have owned that ministry. I don't know if Eileen Ross is here or not. I know uh, uh, Ken's uh, father passed away, but just for Eileen, I'm going to say it anyways. I don't know if any of you realize what she does to help with the warming center. She does something to me that would be very awkward and uncomfortable that I'm not good at doing. She goes business to business with letters asking for support wanting to see managers and saying, hey, we're doing this at our church. Would you donate things? I am so not good at that. I don't know if some of you you might have that that gifting. I'm not good at it. She's amazing at it. She is so amazing at it. She's able to get so many donations and so, like, Meyer gift cards and food from, uh, El Charo donates an entire meal one night simply because she went in and asked for it. And they cater an entire meal. That ministry as well wouldn't be as possible without her. And so many of you as well that come and you donate your time, thank you so much. Up in the sound booth, Paul Carson, you do an amazing job of making an aged sound equipment system work. Here's the thing, with when it comes to sound, you typically don't hear anything about the sound person unless the sound is bad. I mean, at the end of the day, you think, like, wow, the, the sound was off today. There is a, a pop or a crack. Like, my microphone used to crack all the time. It doesn't now. The reason being is Paul helped me identify that when I wear, like, a wool sweater in the winter, it creates a lot of static electricity on my headset. So I know that every time I come in, he bought me a, a little can of uh, static guard. If I got something, if I've got a suit coat, if I've got a sweater, I spray myself down really well and... I don't get the, the, the pops and the cracks anymore. I mean, we need to go through and we need to update the sound system, but Paul has it sounding so good. Knowing what it is and the condition it is, I can't wait until we reach a day where all of a sudden we have the proper sound system for this room where it can sound phenomenal and that Paul can have a, a ball up there running that sound system. I haven't seen him, so Jim Gelsoni, if you're here, wave your hand. I haven't seen him yet. There he is, Jim. So many of you, I don't know if you realize what Jim does because Jim is behind the scenes, that it's usually once or twice a month, he'll drive his van over to uh, where they give out the food for the the food pantry. He'll load his van up with food, and then he backs it up and starts unloading it that... um, Laura Zor helps organize that whole food pantry. That ministry happens because of the two of you. And Jim recently, some of you may not know this, Jim has a green thumb. How many of you, like, you kill plants? Like, right here, you don't want me doing your landscaping. But he's got a green thumb, and a lot of this plants uh, that are brand new out here, he is taking care of. He has won multiple beautification awards for landscaping. And he's taking care of making sure that our church looks beautiful on the outside. Thank you so much for what you're doing. He's probably in the hallway. I'm not seeing him right now. Steve Kajawa heads up our security team. And there's so many of you that are, oh, there, oh yeah, he's right. It's so hard when I'm like going back and forth. But Steve heads up our security team. There's so many of you that 
are a part of this team, I have no question about the safety of the people in this church because of the team that Steve is leading. That there's been a couple moments where there is something that needed to be taken place. I have total confidence and feel total safety with my wife and my kids here because of the ministry that you guys are doing. And I'm looking forward to continuing to upgrade your guys' equipment so that you guys have this building in a place where we don't have to worry about anything from the outside ever happening and we can trust and put our focus completely on God. Thank you for your guys' ministry so much. <laughs> Sonia, for, for you and your husband, you, some of you don't know Sonia Giles uh, because they're relatively new to the church, but they saw a need at our kids' check-in station that it was something that we were trying to, I mean, those of you that have been around in the last two years, you realize I have had tons of fun trying to deal with making that kid's check-in work properly. And Sonia saw a need for someone to be there before each service and said, I'm willing to do that. She saw a need without us even having to present of like, hey, would you do this? She said, can I own that? Can I take that on? And that, that ministry, that, that first impression of when somebody's dropping off their kid for the very first time, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. I know Cheryl's not, uh, Holdwick's not here, but I'm assuming she's out camping on this uh, Memorial Day weekend. I'm pretty sure she's watching right now, so you're all here. I'm going to focus on the camera for a moment because I'm sure Cheryl will check this out. Cheryl, thank you so much for owning discipleship in this church. You are helping draw people closer to God. You're equipping leaders so that they can know how to equip leaders, and we can build up a church that is so strong in discipleship, that knows God so well. Thank you for your work with the anchor groups. I can look at the, the Duge family. Then when we first came, came here, it was one of those things that impressed me that they just started up the, the coffee and the cookie ministry. Guys, thank you so much for doing that. The, the hospitality, the feel when you first walk in, but also the atmosphere of having everybody stay out and hang out and become more of a church family is because of the work that you guys have done. I'm so thankful that we have had the opportunity to build out this cafe so that you can do it on an even greater and an even better level. Thank you so much for helping people feel welcomed and helping create an atmosphere where people can connect and get to know others. <laughs> I'm trying to see over here. I'm not seeing Mike and Donna Crease this morning. Uh, but Mike and Don, if you're watching here, or you guys can let them know I said this, that they head up the Thanksgiving giving, making sure that every single Thanksgiving that we're able to help provide meals for individuals who don't have a Thanksgiving dinner. They're able to uh, help rally. There's so many of you that are involved in donating and, and giving and writing names down for suggestions, but they head up that ministry. Thank you so much, for Mike and Donna, for doing that. The last two that I want to recognize this morning is uh, Jackie Dragna and Carol DePonio, and they're not in the room right now because they're down in the kids' hall. This is something that I do want you guys, everybody in this room to hear. There is essentially eight services that happen each month, four on Sunday, four on Wednesday, and sometimes it can be nine depending on where, if there's a fifth Sunday or a fifth Wednesday. Out of eight services, Jackie is typically in the, the toddler room seven out of eight. Carol is typically in uh, the, the nursery probably six out of a month. They love on the kids amazing. I know my girls absolutely love Carol and Jackie. But here's a moment to say, like, there's a lot of you that have the ability of loving on kids. I know that they would gladly take help because I'm seeing in a day, last week, was it 13 or 14? 13? There was 13 toddlers that Jackie had last week. That's an amazing problem. That means we have young families that are starting to come, that they're trusting their kids to us. As a church, we need to step up and say, you know what? We need this kids' ministry to be the best this kids' ministry can be Carol and Jackie need help because I'm praying for a day where we consistently have 10, 20, 30 
babies and toddlers that are in that hallway because that means that there's new life happening. That means there's a generation for us to train up. You see, Carol may be doing the discipleship to the parents, but you may say, like, oh, I'm not, I can't disciple. I don't feel gifted in teaching to adults. But can you hold a baby? Holding a baby is an amazing ministry. One, it's just good for your soul. Uh, Olivia, I see the hanky over there. There we go. It's just good. I mean, it, yeah, they cry, but you get to, to help soothe them. See, I think you, when you hold a baby, you should really start understanding God on a greater level. Because how many moments, even as adults, that we cry and we complain because we're struggling, and God just holding us saying, don't worry, I've got this. I'm not letting you go. I think holding a baby is a great reminder of that, that God's got us. That the energy that toddlers have, toddlers can take over the world. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's how many of you have a problem and difficulty saying no sometimes? Like, people ask you to do a lot of different things, and you struggle saying no of, like, I, I really need to not, but okay, I'll do it. My girls, they have no problem saying no. If you need to grow in your ability to say no, go work with our toddlers. They will teach you. They will give you the strength and the confidence to say no. But let me even share something. This is a little bit of vision. This isn't going to happen tomorrow by any means. But here's the thing, and I'll use my own daughter, Quinn, as the example. She is uh, two, moving towards two and a half. The way we have our room set up right now is it's birth the, about three years old, and then three to five, and then once they hit five and hit kindergarten, they move into the, uh, the full kids' service with Pastor Parker. Quinn is at an age where she is too big to be around brand new babies but she's also too young to be around almost five-year-olds. The vision that I want to see happen for our church is that first room is going to be birth through 18 months. Once they can start walking, they're going to move into the next room and 18 months to three years old. Once they hit three years old, they're going to move into the next room, which currently has been through the renovation process, uh, through our roof issues. I've kind of locked down, shut down, because there was, especially in the carpet, which is no longer there, uh, there is a little bit of that smell of mold in there. I'm not chancing putting kids in the room until we have it all cleaned up and taken care of. But in that room, I want to have three-year-olds through five-year-olds because I believe in the fact that we need to do appropriate ministry for each of those stages of early childhood so that they can be ministered to in the way that God in intends for it. And Carol and Jackie are doing a phenomenal job, but we need more people in the church as we continue to grow to step up and say, I want to be a part of kids' ministry. I want to be a part of training that next generation so they know who Jesus is, so that I can leave a legacy behind me, so that this church will always continue growing, no matter if there is a day where Jesus, uh, his, his coming back delays, where all of us pass away. And none of us are here anymore, but because we were faithful to raise the next generation, this church continues to thrive. We're, we are f about five years away from celebrating 100 years as the church. If God were to wait another hundred years to return. Imagine if this church still existed and was thriving a hundred years from now because you were willing to raise the next generation who was faithful and would do exactly what God has called them to do. And it all comes back to encouraging. You see, I, I can go through that list and I can tell you I left out a ton of people. I could continue to do that I could do an entire service where I just went one person after another after another who has done incredible things in this church, probably even more so than myself. I've been here for two years. Some of you have been here for two decades or longer. That there could be a shout out after shout out for the ministry, but that's not what it's about. It's about encouraging others and saying, what you're doing is important, what you're doing is seen, and if your name didn't get uh, said this morning, don't feel like, wow, he doesn't appreciate me. No, I just don't have enough time to say what everybody's done but know the fact that our Heavenly Father is seeing exactly what you're doing and is looking at you and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't do it for an audience here. We do it for an audience of one. But when we're intentional about encouraging other people and giving a shout out, I can see it on the, the look on so many of your faces when I went through that and I, I said your name and said what you were doing. There is this look of, yes, humility, but a look of, like, I was recognized. Be intentional about encouraging other people 
and doing it verbally. Because we can do all these other things, but when we tell people what you're doing it matters, what you're doing, go to, go to the kid leaders and say, what you're doing in my child is making a difference in my child's life. Encourage them because they're, you're in a nice atmosphere today where there's worship music going on and, and a message. And then they're going to be walking out of kid service saying, we just had 30 kids running around screaming for an hour and a half. And yes, they learn about Jesus, but wow, like, I need to take a break for a moment. Encourage them because they're taking care of your kids and teaching them about Jesus so that you can learn about Jesus, so that you can have every tool that you need, so that you can go home and you can disciple your kids all week long or your grandkids all week long and pour into other people. This morning, here's what we're going to do in just a moment. We're not going to have the worship team come back up today. Uh, well, if you, oh, good, it's, it's still up there. Uh, this last slide, these are the different ways we can encourage people. On the back of your bulletin, you have your sermon notes. If you haven't already written on it, if you, uh, if you have and you're, you're saying, like, I need more space, grab an offering envelope to do this. I want to make sure that you write down each of these different ways, sharing your faith, sharing scripture, through Christ's power, meeting needs, through prayer, and through public statements. And we're going to turn on just one worship song and what I want you to do for the next three or four minutes, and then I'll come up and I'll pray and we'll be done, is I want you to ask God and say, whose names, give me six name gods of people that I need to encourage this next week. And you may not get this all put together. God may say, okay, this is the person that you need to pray for. This is the person that you may need to meet a need that you're already aware of. But until we meet again, there's six days, six ways to encourage somebody. I'm asking you to pray for six people's names that you're going to intentionally encourage Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that when we come back here next week and next Sunday, you'll have encouraged six people between now and then. So we're going to just turn on one worship song. I'll come back up and I'll, I'll pray to dismiss. And you may get all these people quickly. You may need to spend the rest of the today just thinking, okay, God, who is that person? Who is it that I'm supposed to encourage? But I just want us to take six minutes or about five minutes, and just pray about these six people of who is it, God, that you are calling me to reach out to.